we're back. I'm so excited to welcome Jamak, who founded the term Data Mesh. The story is fascinating and I won't do it justice, so I'm just going to turn it over to Jamak to explain what Data Mesh is, and in her second talk, she'll explain how to build it. Welcome, Jamak. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here to talk about uh, Data Mesh. We have a two part session at Data Nova for you covering Data Mesh. The first part, we will talk about um, kind of why Data Mesh and what it is at a very high level, why, why it's a paradigm shift in big data analytics. Um, Kind of data management and the second part we go deep uh, deep dive into uh, how to build data mesh and what's what, what's the foundation of it um, i work as the um, director of uh, emerging technologies at thoughtworks i work with a lot of clients and um, one of the perks of uh, being uh, a consultant at thoughtworks and work with you know a variety of clients globally sit on the tech advisory boards um, is that you get to see the really the deepest desires and the challenges that the companies have when it comes to data. One, one thing has been evident that every company that I come across, every CEO, every CTO has a big data AI agenda on its innovation roadmap, on its strategy roadmap. So there have been big expectations. And I want to just share a few mission statements that have been publicly shared uh, to just bring that to your attention. Uh, so this one from a brilliant financial platform company, our mission is to power prosperity around the world as an AI driven expert platform. Quite audacious, right? Um, so it's one of the foundational pillars of the company. This other one is from a telco in North America, by people for people, we incorporate human oversight into AI. With people at core, AI can enhance the workforce. So the mission of this company is changing, you know, streamlining their processes, optimizing their processes using data and AI. And finally, one of the largest health insurance in North America, our mission is to improve every single member's experience at every single touch point with our organization through data and AI. So this particular company wants to serve you as customers much better using data and AI. So these are all audacious, admirable goals. But the inconvenient truth is that despite increased investment in AI and data, the results have not been that great. Um, I encourage you to go and download and have a browse uh, through New Vantage Partners annual report. It's an annual report and sur survey from the top 6,000, I think, companies, their executives, and to kind of understand where they are with their investments around data and AI and what results are getting. We have, I suppose, a bunch of data focused people on this call. Uh, so I'm curious what stands out to you on this chart? To me, what it stood out was that the amount of investment that is going to big data and, and AI, and, and this is just a small snippet of that, that the last bar shows that more than 50%, about 65% of the companies are spending more than $50 million on big data and AI, and the rest of them are spending, you know, bands be, be, uh, below that. But as you can see, the result of getting um, transformational change, have a data culture, become data-driven, compete on data, it's not that great, right? 27%, 38%, 45% at, at max. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that maybe there are some assumptions that we need to challenge. But the hypothesis around data mesh came around when we started seeing these failure modes at scale in the wild with our clients. And the two dominant failure modes are the ones in the middle. Clients were failing to scale adoption of the data or democratization of the data at scale when it came to the proliferation and the number of sources that they had. So as the companies became more complex, had more domains, had more touch points with their clients, and the diversity of the data increased, they struggle to get that data to the hands of data scientists and data engineers to actually do create value. And at the same time, as the company's you know, agenda becomes more data-driven, as we saw like in the first slide, uh, they were struggling to, um, I guess, get speed in terms of satisfying the needs of those use cases using, using data. So they had these two points of friction around scale, scale of sources, a scale of consumers. And I'm not really talking about the volume of the data. I think we've done, technology-wise, we've done amazing work to manage large volumes of data. 
But it comes to the diversity, the dynamic topology of the continuous change around the sources and the, and the consumption cases. And the two other failure modes are basically response to that. So what we see is when the company struggles with their existing data solutions, they said, well, what shall we do? Natural answer is let's build the next big platform, right? So you end up in this continuous trap of trying to bootstrap your next big data platform. And, and we've saw various failure modes around that, you know, going, getting stuck in strategy, never materializing into architecture or getting stuck in just doing um, spikes around different solutions, never really seeing value at the end. So I don't want to trivialize, trivialize the challenge around, um, you know, turning a company become data driven. This is this is a multi dimensional challenge around culture, around people, around technology. But I'm a technologist, so I'm just going to focus here on kind of architecture aspects and technology. Te uh, I guess technology aspects of the challenge we've had. And to introduce data mesh, I think we need to step back and look at what have we done so far. Where have we come over? Um, you know, half a century, essentially, since we started thinking about data warehousing and using data for business intelligence. So I think the first thing to mention is that when we say data, what do we really mean? And that depends who you ask in the organization. So are you asking your operational folks who are building the applications and running the business and they have, you know, they're building the database, you know, sorry, microservices and APIs or legacy systems, and they have databases that support that? Or are we asking the BI team, analytics team, machine learning team that is probably somewhere else on this in, in the organization and is trying to optimize the business, right? To give you the best personalized experience using your data or um, optimize the sales process using, um, using data or giving management intelligence around market share. These two worlds have been far divided and away from each other in terms of both technology and organizational structure. So very quickly, I think I talked to operational data. Operational data is essentially, um, you know, databases that sits behind your microservices, sits behind your applications, and it keeps the current state of your business. It's often transactional databases and you're doing, you know, CRUD operations. It's often called data on the inside, right? Um, I think Pat Allen had this wonderful article on ACM on this distinguishing between data on the inside and data outside. This is not data on the inside, nobody's business to touch it, but the application's logic. Right? And, and I think we've done an amazing work around technology to create polyglot data stores from relational databases traditionally to graph databases to NoSQL databases and so on. And then on the analytical data plane, the data that we keep in our data warehouses or data leaks, it has a different nature, right? The purpose of it is, well, I need to optimize analysis of the data, I need to be able to show the trends, I need to be able to do predictions, so train mach machine learning. So it has a very temporal and temporal and time variant. I guess the traditional definition of an analytical data is a, a data that is integrated around a particular subject like customers, orders, whatever the domains are, it's time variant. So you can have a temporal view of the data, data from the past and the data that you're going to predict, I suppose, for a future. And it's the data on the outside, right? It's the data that you just share with everybody to use however they want to use it. There's no logic really to protect it. And again, in this space, I think we've done good work in terms of managing the volume of analytical data in a polyglot format. So we have object store um, storage and big tables and streams to kind of help with management of the big data. This is the space that I think we need to focus on. And this is the space that there is, a, there is a challenge that we need to address. As a starting point, the way we have divided our organization and technology around these two separate planes and the way we are integrating them through these ETL pipelines is the source of trouble just to start with. Like anybody who worked on data pipelines that consumes data from somewhere in the organization and is supposed to put it in some other lake or storage for somebody else to use, is well aware of the pain of keeping these labyrinths of data pipelines healthy and running, where a small upstream change can have cascading effects to break your pipelines. And you have no idea why it happened, where it happened. You have no trust in the quality of the data that you're extracting from the data on the inside, right? The data that we didn't need to touch and kind of put it somewhere that you really don't know how it's going to be used. So this misintegration through this ETL or data pipelines is a place that data mesh looks at 
um, and tries to introduce a new integration model while respecting the differences between the, these two planes, um, technical respect, um, you know, differences, how people want to access the data. These are, this still requires a different set of technologies, but integrated differently. So we have evolved in terms of big data um, analytical data management. So we have the generation one, right? Data warehousing, more than half a century old. Um, and the, the, in this particular paradigm, you basically get grab data extracted from uh, the databases of operation systems, put them in this beautifully designed canonical model of star schema so that downstream your data analysts can run any SQL query that they desire to create reports and visualizations and dashboards. And this has worked pretty well for, you know, use cases that we had half a century ago till maybe, you know, um, 10, 20 years ago, where we really needed kind of maybe um, reports that they didn't have high frequency of change, maybe the data didn't change as much. So it was a solid approach to and perhaps a fair assumption to say, I will give you one canonical model to, <clears throat> to get access to your data, to run SQL-like queries, uh, to create business intelligence and so on. Let me just very quickly look at the technologies that we have around this. And these technologies are amazing. They do what they're supposed to do. And there's nothing wrong with the technology per se, but it's just the approach is challenging. And the technologies we see are, you know, the snowflakes, the big queries, for um, actual structured storage of the data or semi-structured storage of the data that allows you to then query and visualize with the likes of Looker and Tableau. 2010, that was when we were getting like really um, aggressively, I suppose, using data through machine learning um, and try to use it for a different set of operations, right? Operations by, that require data scientists to kind of analyze the data in its more raw format to understand the to discover the signals from the noise themselves. They didn't need a perfectly modeled data. So then the evolution of data lake happened, a proposal from uh, James Dixon explaining that instead of having these bottled waters, you know, water that we perfectly kind of cleansed and bottled and put into tables, why don't we just extract the data anyway from the operational systems and then load it into this kind of semi-structured raw format, don't do much transformation on it, and then leave it to downstream data scientists to train their machine learnings, run their pipelines to do whatever cleansing transformation that they need to do. And if they, we need to create you know, data warehouses for SQL access, we, we do that as well more downstream. And that was certainly a you know, that was certainly an improvement because now you remove that big bottleneck of a specialized team trying to transform the data through this kind of Chinese whisper of data pipelines in, into a canonical model and have more raw data available. And the technologies that evolved around that, these are some of the ones I sprinkled here. There are a lot more. You just need to go to one of the cloud providers and look at the technology they provide. But essentially includes, you know, um, technologies around data orchestration, orchestration of jobs, these processing tasks that need to be done, a storage of the object storage, um, kind of semi-structured storage and access and <clears throat> query systems on top of it, like distributed query systems on top of it. The challenge with um, kind of data like that we've seen is that now we've swung from this one canonical model to maybe not so much of the modeling and we hear words like, you know, we've ended up with data swamps. So data that we're not clear who really owns them and so on. So there have been challenges with the data lakes as well. And then, you know, the, the, the answer has been, well, let's build the third generation data architecture. And this is what we see today, like it's this kind of multimodal data architecture, get the, get the best of the lake and the best of the warehouse and put them on the cloud. And uh, this is just a copy of um, GCP data lake architecture on the cloud. You can just search for a provider of your choice and they all more or less look the same. Still operational plane, getting the data out and put them in storage, object storage, and then um, model them downstream and have these pipelines in the middle to stitch them together. Certainly there has been evolutionary improvements, right? We've gone from warehouse to lake to multimodal cloud storage. In parallel to this evolutionary improvement of at the architectural level, if you just look at the technology, that's out there. Uh, this is uh, not for your reading, uh, just for you to glance and feel dizzy. 
the point I want to make is that we haven't we have been busy we've been busy innovating and building technologies so then why the failure modes that we are seeing at scale and again these are not the failure modes of the digital natives necessarily this may not be the failure modes of the smaller companies or a smaller in terms of the domain or the purpose of the operations that they have but we're certainly seeing these challenges across the board with larger more complex domains so I think uh, we need to challenge certain assumptions. And here, I want you to kind of put your critical hat on and challenge some of the assumptions that we accepted as the truth, as the norm and pat norm, um, and see what we can change. And, and we arrive by challenging the assumptions, we arrive at what data mesh is about. So the very first assumption, half a century old assumption, is that the data management solution architecture shall be monolithic. If you look really at a, at a far, like go high up, look back at your enterprise architecture, I promise you will see something like this. At its core, it expects to consume data from this number of sources, left-hand side, orange, yellow boxes, from the corners of your organization, and then uh, provide data to you know, a set of very diverse use cases. Some you might know, and some you might not even know today, right? They're, they're continuously changing. And as you know, I'm sure that techie folks and architecture architects in this call, monolithic architectures are wonderful to get started with, to get started with, because they're simple, right? You put one team in charge of it, perhaps one backlog, simple tech stacks, one solution, one vendor, you know, less moving parts. But they are pain in the back when you scale. They're very, very difficult to scale. And as you can see, this becomes a point of friction right at the middle, trying to respond to all of these needs and, and, and sources. The second assumption we've made, and this is the dream of almost every CIO, that data must be centralized to be useful. And I empathize with that kind of thought process because the thought process comes from a place of siloed data in operational databases. Remember those microservices, those legacy applications or systems of records? They all have their own databases that they're hiding their data in and nobody can get access to. So then what's the reaction to that? Let's move the data all in one place so we can get access to, right? But when you centralize data for it to be useful, then you centralize the people around it, centralize the technology as we talked about, and you lose the ownership and the meaning of the data from the source, where it gets generated. You lose the, uh, the meaning you know, of, and, and the ownership of the domains where this data is produced. So then what happens? What happens when we centralize the architecture, centralize the data? There would be a day when the architect and the organization says, this is not working. We've got a team that are stepping on each other's toes. They, you know, the technology, that they can't respond as fast, as quickly as the need of modern business that you know it's been told um, experiment 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 so you need kind of continuously have access to new views and new modes of data i guess the least resistance path to decomposition of the architecture is always around um, kind of technical partitioning you really when it comes at a very high level of decomposition of the architecture you have two choices: a domain oriented maybe you have other choices but at least the two major kind of paradigms are either i'm going to decompose this around domain like what we did microservices, right? We, we just said, okay, the orders domain, customer domain, listeners here, um, let's, let's use the digital media streaming, media players, teams. So we, we break it down around kind of the domain or we break it down around the technical tasks and functions. And in case of some of the big data architectures, you will see both technology as well as the structure of the architecture is decomposed around technical functions. like. The task of ingesting data. Let's go optimize that. Let's go buy a technology that does ingestion really well from on-prem to cloud, for example, right? Let's go uh, now put a team and a set of pipelines together to do the processing. And now downstream, build a whole bunch of APIs for serving. So this is a very technical decomposition. And a consequence of a technical decomposition is more friction because the change doesn't necessarily localize itself to a technical function. The change features 
value outcome is orthogonal to these technical phases. If you want to introduce a new use case for your data or you want to add, create new value, like you want to do, okay, we have a new business function. We want to re recognize emerging artists. So to recognize emerging artists, you probably need to tap into a whole bunch of data that you haven't tapped into. You make them available as analytical data. You need to build a whole set of like perhaps classification machine learning models to classify your emerging or declining artists. So that is not, let's just do ingestion changes or let's just build a bunch of APIs, right? This is orthogonal to change. And, and that means back to square one, high friction, slow to change, slow to respond to scale. And I wanna talk about people. Whenever we talk about technology, we should talk about the people who run the technology and these are my fellow data engineers, data platform teams, you know, BI folks that have been isolated from the domains. And their job in the middle is build the pipelines, respond to this change, build, do activities, right? Do the ingestion, do the other activities. Uh, and their life is, <laughs> I don't envy their life. It's, it's, it's kind of difficult, right? It's dealing with people on the left-hand side, they're happily running the business with their databases. We have no intention or incentive to provide meaningful, trustworthy, quality data and, and frustrated customers on the right-hand side looking for um, new, new, new data and they're impatiently waiting, right? For the data, data engineers to do their job. So I leave you with this quote from Einstein. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. So what shall we do? Data Mesh attempts to challenge that these assumptions that we just agreed and accepted on for over half a century and says, let's actually create a paradigm shift. Let's challenge those and see how else we can divide the architecture, how else we can divide the ownership what is the role of the platform? What are the roles of the domains? And then build the technology to support it. So just to be clear, the objective of the data mesh is really to respond to scale. If you're a small company, if you don't have the diversity of the domains, it may not be for you. But if you have constant change in your data landscape, the topology of the data continues to changing, the proliferation of the sources and the consumers, the diversity of the transformation that's needed. One day you want to look at your listeners in one way and the other, you know, the other day you want to like augment it with new information. You know, we want to reintroduce market data, external, external market research into the data. You want to start, you know, establishing data relationships with other companies using their data. So if you have that dynamic topology and you need to respond to change fast, then um, come along. But uh, to reject what par one paradigm without simultaneously substituting with another is rejecting science. So if I'm here to claim that the past paradigm doesn't work, I better, better have an answer for you. And the answer is really these principles of the data mesh. So the four principles, the, the principles around really how you break down the ownership and architecture from technical to domain oriented, the change of mindset around data as a product and the architecture that should support that. The new kind of infrastructure we need to build to allow this distribution of ownership and architecture. And finally, how the new world or order, how we govern the data. So um, if you're interested to know more how to build these principles and bring them to life, come and join me back in part two and we deep dive into this. Thank you. I hope you found that as interesting as I did. We talk a lot about the failures of the single source of the truth model and mindset made famous by the enterprise data warehouse model. And we're also advocates of there being a better way. Take another quick break and we'll close out with how to approach building a data mesh architecture. Yeah.